tour in the room because I came here the first time in 1976 uh, as a, I just had graduated 77 from MIT with Nevin Scrimshaw and we were just starting the United Nations University uh, program and he asked me to go and visit various places to recruit fellows that would then return. So I visited, I visited um, Morocco, I visited Rabat, and did not come to Marrakesh, was Rabat and Casablanca, the universities. Uh, and I interviewed about sev six, seven people, and they left that to be trained. All made a commitment at the time that they were being interviewed that they would come back to Morocco. So I'm not sure if it's by coincidence, but Mansour is here today, and I'm very pleased about this. He's not here in the room, but I had a chance to ch uh, prog uh, check his progress. Uh, I will be discussing today the topic of stunting, and let me just, I, I think it's ready to go. So we'll be talking about the two sides of this coin, stunting and obesity. And this is the Dohat theme that things that happen very early go with us throughout life. And eventually, we, also, we owe it not only to our parents, but actually to our grandparents. There's uh, the influence of the grandmothers on the mothers and thus on the offsprings of the second generation. I will show you some of the long-term consequences, and at the end, I will show you some data from Latin America on the cost of malnutrition, considering how early effects have lasting effects. I will also discuss with you the relationship between early nutrition and chronic disease, focusing mainly on obesity, where we have most of the information. And also consider with you how early should we be intervening to take care of the NCDs? How many of you are aware that only two weeks ago there was a major summit in New York to address the major killers of the world today? And it should not be seen that you either worry about the heart attacks, the diabetes, and the obese, or the malnourished children. You need to do both, because if you don't take care of one, you'll get more of the other. So we should not be fighting what is more important. We need to do both and definitely start early. This is precisely that view. This is human survival over the last uh, maybe century. And this is, think about this, the start here where 100,000 children were born, trying to get a pointer, is there a pointer? Or I, I have a pointer right here, okay. So, we see that in the first five years, a lot of death, and then stabilization. The thing that has not changed is how old can you be? And in fact, the human species can be around 105 on average. Even the last queen of England who died, she died at 106, 107. So the human species will live between 103 to 105 in the best conditions. The 1930 curve that is illustrated here is illustrating mean life expectancy in the 30s, but, which was about 45. But that is present day Afghanistan. So we have some people in today's world that have a life expectancy of what it used to be 100 years ago. While others in Sweden, that has one of the longest life expectancy, have pushed a little bit the border and the Swedish data for the last 200 years showed that the, the longest lived Swede, in fact, has gained about three or four years on average, which is a tremendous feat because that means that Sweden, uh, Norway, um, also Japan, uh, and Finland have actually the highest life expectancy in the world. They're doing something right that we should learn from that. But it's not, all, it's not enough to be alive. We want to be physically and mentally fit. And that then is a lifelong event and nutrition plays an important role, both in conditioning fetal growth, stunting and wasting, the vitamin deficiencies, but also in cardiovascular disease, cancer related to diet, osteoporosis and aging. So we have something for both the young and the old, 
and for every stage in between. If we look at the close to 9 million deaths, excuse me, the, the close to 55 million deaths that occur, the major killer is blood pressure. And how does blood pressure relate to nutrition? Obesity, sodium, stress, lack of sleep, those are factors that play a role in, in, in the death from hypertension. Tobacco, a preventable tobacco should not be killing uh, five million people. Uh, but the nutrition are involved, high cholesterol. Look at the, the red, the pink, and the blue are the various places around the world. When we see blood pressure, it kills people all over the world, not only the rich and famous. It kills also the poor, and it kills them very early. So we're not only losing life, but we're also losing healthy life years. It's a bad business case to have a death at somebody at 40 when he still has 20 years ahead of him, which are productive. Underweight is still uh, killing people, and you will see that it's occurring mainly in developing countries if you look at where the pink is located. Unsafe sex, low fruit and vegetable consumption. How many of you take five a day? How many five fruits? How many take six a day? How many take seven a day? The best number is really about eight a day. It is, it's actually, it's about 500 grams of fruits and vegetables per day is what we would need to minimize uh, the risk that are related to low, not only fiber, it's not the fiber, it is intact plant cell walls. It's the food. It's not that you add something that is left over from the harvest and say this is fiber, no. It is intact plant cell walls, very important. It is not chemical, it's a food in a right combination. Uh, physical inactivity kills about three million people. Alcohol, iron deficiency, zinc, and the, so the deficiency diseases are killing mainly children. That's why we need to do something about it. But in general, the main causes of death now are the nutrition-related chronic diseases. Some of you may have seen this about uh, in the year 2000, the Standing Committee on Nutrition, uh, we were asked with Professor Philip James, myself, Mohammed ul Haq, and uh, Professor Swaminathan and Karen Orum and others, and Julia Tewari from Africa, to prepare a look towards the future. And one thing that was evident is that we need to look at this as a cycle, a life cycle, a life course approach. What was missing here, we just looked at the undernutrition side, has actually now been included, which is if you ha are undernourished in utero or early on in life and gain weight, and usually it's not difficult to have somebody gain weight. The main problem is to have them gain height and gain head circumference. So if you gain weight but do not compensate on the height, you're stunted, and not necessarily obese, but have a large belly. The fat is in the visceral tissue, and that's a bad thing to have early on in life. But this shows how we are all interlinked, and if we're going to address this, we need to start early. So who is the malnourished here? How many of you think that this child is malnourished? Let me just see if I can get, I'm not sure if I can get the arrow. How many of you think that this child is malnourished? Anybody think? How many think that this child, the child who is seven years old and 105 centimeters is malnourished? Does he look malnourished? He has a fat belly, but he does not look too malnourished. And of course, the normal is the four-year-old at one meter. So we have two children that are about the same height, but are three years apart, and two children are the same height, excuse me, age, but are 20 centimeters apart. Of course, the child on the, on the left is stunted and has increased abdominal obesity, increased fat in his belly, and that is the most dangerous type of fat, and, you, and he may, he's the one that's gonna grow up hypertensive and will have a, a risk of diabetes even before he gets to be obese. As you know, in Asia, Diabetes, and also all of the population of the Americas came from Asia. So in Mexico too, 
And the truth is that you don't need to be obese with a BMI over 30 to get diabetes, not even at 25. BMIs between 23 and above already have increased risk of diabetes in this Asian phenotype. So it affects infants before and early after birth. It relates most of the time to either maternal conditions that were, as was described, placenta, transfer, but also micronutrient deficiencies. It's linked to maternal size. A mother in Guatemala nowadays measures 1.47 meters. That mother, it is no surprise that about 50% of the children are low birth weight. And it is also no surprise that both Mexico and Central America are seeing great numbers of people with hypertension and with diabetes dying very early. So length that is lost is rarely recovered. You're born with 50 centimeters. By four years of age, you're one meter. The centimeters that you lost there, you will never pick it up unless you slow down maturation. Where did that happen? In Egypt, in, in, in uh, Iran, with the zinc deficiency, uh, without, uh, with the unleavened bread and with the low meat consumption. And obviously, that was the place where this was described. If you slow down hormonal maturation, you can grow later, which is the case of the Prasad disruption from Egypt and Iran. This under and over is illustrated in these countries. And of course, this data is from Mercedes Dionis, a little bit old, but she's produced new data showing exactly the same. So in the same country, you have obesity and underweight coexisting. So you need to worry about both. We're talking about healthy growth, neither obese nor underweight. This is within the same families. In the same family, the mother being obese, the child being malnourished. If you feed a lot of carbohydrates, you will have a stunted child, and you will have an obese mother. So the same diet that produces the obesity in the mother is conducive to the stunting of the child. So we should not interpret that the child is being overfed. He's being fed excess calories, but inadequate nutrition. And that's a very important point that we get this out. This is not excess, it is unbalanced energy, inadequate micronutrient intake for appropriate growth. So you already heard that once, you, you probably heard 150, the latest figure is really 171 million from Mercedes Dionis. But what's relevant here, in green is Africa. If you look at Africa, between 1990 and 2010, the stunting prevalence has dropped only 2%, from 40 to 38%. As opposed to that, in Latin America, it dropped from 23% down to 13, and in Asia, from 48 to 27. And you can see, in green, on the number affected, the Africa number of stunted children, in fact, has increased from 45 million to 60 million. So we need to do better in Africa, not only in child survival, but also in child growth. And the other point that is very relevant, you've seen this curve, but look how early the drop occurs. I'd like to stress a point that was made by Dr. Jackson, and another point that any pediatrician will identify, which is that in fact, on the blue line, height is dropping before weight for length.